Hello and welcome to Inside Healthcare. Here in Minnesota and across the country, spring has arrived early and that means a lot of people are already suffering from spring allergies. And since allergies are one of the top triggers for asthma, that makes this spring especially tough for Minnesotans with asthma. We're here at the urgency room in Venice Heights to talk with Dr. Tim Johnson. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for coming. And we're going to talk about allergies and asthma. First of all, allergies, I know I've heard a number of people saying, I, I think I have allergies, not sure if I have a cold. What were some of those common symptoms of allergies and the difference between a cold and that? It's hard to sort out uh, seasonal allergies from a cold because they both the big symptom that you get is allergic rhinitis. So we all make kind of gross to talk about on TV, I guess a little bit, but we all make mucus all the time and we don't even know about it because it's just it's thin and it runs down the back of our throat and we handle those secretions kind of on their own. But when something amps up the amount of mucus that you're making or it gets thicker, that, that can be your seasonal allergies or can also be a cold. The most reliable thing is if you also kind of feel your eyes itching, if you kind of feel that kind of skin itchy kind of thing, and then usually it's a pretty reliable time of the year. As you kind of mentioned in the opening piece, you know, this is the time of year and this early spring, man, we love it, but it's also kind of right. hurting us because of the pollen that's made by its weeds, grasses, and trees. Um, and so, um, fun fact, you can kind of look online, most of the online weather uh, oh, that's sites right. mm -hmm. will have something in terms pollen of pollen counts. Pollen. And I just actually checked it this morning and it turns out that uh, pollen counts so far in Minnesota are pretty low. South of us and east of us, they're in full bloom and people are really in rough shape. It has that a lot way. to do with maybe snow cover and, and grass starting already to green and, and that or Exactly right. In yeah. the springtime when everything starts to kind of flower and we think we don't really think of flowers and or I'm sorry, we don't think of uh, trees and grasses flowering so much, right. but they sure are just yeah, kind of microscopic. I just started noticing that too, that things are really just starting to get a little green in that too. So what would be some of the best ways to treat allergies if this first time you had them and things, what, what works, what doesn't work? Well, the things that, uh, the mainstay of treatment is antihistamines, so um, things like well, loratadine or fexofenadine or any of those, mo and most of those are over the counter and there's a whole, you know, 10 years ago, all the, they, all they the weren't, yeah. yeah, all the good ones were prescription. They're all over the counter now. It's not a real big deal. Probably one of the most um, effective things you can do for uh, allergic rhinitis is uh, a nasal steroid. And again, those are over the counter now. Okay. And uh, that's great. Yeah, and then kind of a third line treatment would be kind of the mast cell stabilizers, uh, things like uh, chromalin and sodium, which are also now over the counter. And I understand allergies you can develop pretty much any time in your life. And you can outgrow them too as well? Well, they kind of wax and wane. It has to do with kind of how much of the uh, antigenic load, how much of the pollen is out in the air. And then also, we never get better at allergies. We always get worse at them. So every time our immune system is challenged with a, something we're allergic to, we have a little bit more violent reaction every time. That's why sometimes you'll notice people will go on vacation to somewhere where they have different flora and uh, they'll say, hey, I went to Hawaii and my allergies were gone, or I went to Arizona and my allergies were gone, and the people in Arizona are dying because they're, they're, <laughs> they're challenged by the flora they have. They come to Minnesota and do better, you know what I mean? So it, it, it kind of works that way. I had the same experience when I, uh, my daughter and a friend, we went to Mexico, and all of a sudden the friend was getting sick, and it turned out her allergies kicked in because of the conditions down there versus here in Minnesota. So we had mentioned one at the top um, that one of the top triggers for um, asthma is allergies. So what happens w with the body when you have an asthma attack? So when you have an asthma attack, what happens is there's kind of two things that happen at the same time and they're both bad. So one is that you have an increase, th that increase in mucus that we kind of talked about can kind of block up the airways. So you, our biggest, fattest airways are called, are called bronchi. And then those split off into smaller branches like a tree, you know, you know, br uh, smaller bronchioles down. And those can be plugged with mucus. And then also the, the lining of those can become inflamed. So it's an inflammatory response. They can become inflamed and they get thicker. And then at the same time, there's also um, a response where there's muscles, actually a thin wall of muscle in the walls of those airways, and they can actually spasm. And so it's really pretty remarkable. If, if you think about it, even a one millimeter increase in the swelling or the thickness of a lining can, depending on how thick that tube is, can decrease its 
its diameter by half or more. And when some people are having a, an asthma, a real bad asthma flare, that can be decreased by 70 or 80 percent. So it's really hard to get air in and And the out. allergies themselves can trigger this. They asthma can. Flare. There's other things that can tr trigger asthma flare. So in terms of the the inflammatory response, absolutely seasonal allergies can do that. And then there's some sometimes in terms of the the reflex uh, bronchospasm, the muscles contracting. It can be things that are just instantaneously come upon, like cigarette smoke, like wood smoke, like really strong perfumes, like really small, small, uh, strong chemical smells. Um, there's some medications that can do that too, like uh, some people have that reaction to aspirin or Motrin or, I'm sorry, uh, uh, ibuprofen. Really? Yeah. NSAIDs can kind of do I that. I haven't heard that. Or beta blockers. Some people that have high blood pressure, if they have that and they're tried on a, on a, on a class of medications called beta blockers, like metoprolol or atenolol can make their asthma flare. Are there certain people more at a higher risk for developing asthma? Yeah, it tends to run in families. And when we talk about, particularly with children, we talk about, uh, in medicine, we talk about uh, something called atopy or the atopic triangle which is a, a ten dollar word for when somebody is atopic that means they have a tendency to have asthma seasonal allergies and eczema oh so, gosh, so if yeah. your so if your kid has seasonal allergies and eczema they're a smart bet for having asthma too probably about an 80 percent chance so if you know that your child or someone in the family has this then what can you do to try to prevent or reduce an asthma flare or an asthma attack? Then. So uh, sometimes it's hard to predict when they're going to get a whiff of some sort of chemical or something like that, but you can kind of keep them away from strong chemicals, I guess. Um, trying to control their seasonal allergy symptoms ahead of time, making sure that you stay on top of it is a smart bet. And then also keeping them away from smoke, cigarette smoke. And then there's the things that also kind of follow us around all the time, like uh, if you have a pet, pet hair, pet dander, um, dust mites, you know, having a, a dust cover on your mattress. Uh, believe it or not, it's it's not the dust mites, but it's actually their droppings that are highly allergenic for a oh lot of people. Yeah, sounds and gross too. <laughs> it's pretty gross, yeah. <laughs> but uh, so you know, vacuuming, um, you know, making sure you kind of vacuum the mattress and keep a and keep a dust cover on it. That can prevent a lot of that stuff. So that's the stuff we live with all the time. And then, um, so while spring kind of brings the pollen, winter brings kind of the mold. And so um, sometimes we have a different asthma flares from different or times of year. overlapping and things And they like can that. overlap. So maybe as winter's ending and spring's starting, that's where we really get the double whammy. And this is a dangerous time of year. It can cause some of these asthma flares. When should someone go see a doctor about if they're experiencing some of these symptoms? I think when people feel like they can't get enough breath, I think that's a, a good time to at least think about it. Now, a lot of people will have what we call rescue inhalers, and those typically contain albuterol. Oh, yeah, I've seen those. And albuterol is, or you know, sometimes they'll call it their puffer, uh, and they can take a breath of, the, they can inhale that, and what that does is it causes smooth muscle, muscle relaxation, and it can make the airways relax a little bit. It also has a side effect that it makes your heart be a little bit faster. Uh, that's not an allergy or a, a, a bad thing. That's everybody. That's every human being will do that. And that's kind of the cost of doing business a little bit. Um, I think it's reasonable for people to try to take uh, a few breaths of their inhaler and see if they can kind of control it and see if they can kind of get away from whatever offending agent is, is making them flare. Get away from the dog hair. Get away from the cold air that might be making them flare. And they know usually what is the trigger? I think most people that have frequent asthma attacks have a pretty good idea what their triggers are. It's the people that have infrequent asthma attacks that maybe, and then maybe they don't have an inhaler. Those are the people that kind of, a little paradoxically, can become worrisome because they're fine most of the time until they're not fine. Mm -hmm. And then they don't have that rescue inhaler around. They're not sh sure what to do. Certainly in those cases, we would suggest that they seek medical attention pretty quickly. And um, what would be those symptoms of someone that should seek immediate medical care come to the urgency room? I think, I think if they've used their, their inhaler a time or two, uh, or a few times, say, you know, uh, so let me kind of backtrack to that a little bit. A lot of times when an albuterol inhaler is written, the prescription instructions say take two puffs up, to, you know, up to four times a day or no more than four times a day. And I, nothing when they're having symptoms, just periodically? Uh, no, no, sy symptomatically, Symptomatic, typically, okay. although some people do it all then. Okay. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with that. I mean, in the urgency room, when people are having a really bad asthma flare, we'll give them continuous nebulized albuterol. We may give them a constant stream of albuterol for 
15, 30, 60 minutes. So if somebody needs to use more than one dose of their albuterol to try to get relief, certainly that's reasonable. But there becomes a point pretty quickly at which they can realize it's not helping or it's not helping enough. And at that point, we don't want them to suffer in silence alone. Um, certainly they can come in to the urgency room or a facility like this. And they can, uh, we can, first of all, we can measure their oxygen saturations, make sure that they're not actually hypoxic or dangerously low on oxygen, because that curve falls off pretty quickly. Normal people have an oxygen saturation between 95 and 100%, and once you get below 90%, it falls off very precipitously. Your ability of your blood to hang on to oxygen drops like a rock after that, so you can get into trouble pretty quickly. We can also make sure that we give them nebulized albuterol. We can actually, if we have to, we can, we can actually have them uh, uh, breathe through a, um, uh, a nebulizer handpiece or we can actually put it through face mask if we have to. We can give them um, steroids. Some people typically will be on something like prednisone or also people with COPD will sometimes be on prednisone. That's an oral medication that helps to decrease the inflammation of the airways. It doesn't work immediately like the albuterol would. Um, but over time, over a period of days, it can kind of make that inflammation go down and kind of make this thing heal. And then the other thing is that there are some people that we will give high dose inhaled medicine to, and we'll do it for an hour, two hours, and, and they're not, uh, and they'll turn around. Most will turn around, but a few will not. Mm -hmm. And the ones that don't, then um, they may need to actually have um, continuous nebulized treatments, you know, overnight in a hospital or something like that. Um, but for the most part, most people, I would say greater than 90% of people, turn around once they've gotten enough time and attention and enough of that medicine and away from the offending agents and, and have gotten the proper care. And, and coming to the urgency room versus going to a clinic, you have this higher level of care, emergency physicians like yourself here on, on hand. Some of the retail clinics, I, I, I think, probably do have a pulse oximeter. I don't know that they can administer oxygen. I don't know that they can administer nebulized treatments. Um, there's probably urgent cares that can. There's probably a few uh, physician offices that can, but I, I, it, it's kind of hit or miss. Mm -hmm. And so uh, one of the things that we make sure that we have that capability here um, so, that we, so that we can offer that. And I understand like when this happens too sometimes that, that the patient isn't able to even communicate what's going on, so maybe a good idea to have some kind of identification on them that says they're at risk for asthma or they have asthma? I think it's, uh, I think it's a great idea. Plus, if you have any, any uh, severe allergies that need to go on a, a medical ID alert. Oh, and you that, can't talk or something. And you can't yeah. talk yeah. or, or, or uh, you're so re in so, so much respiratory stress that you can't effectively communicate, um, that's certainly a great idea. And are there different symptoms between like an adult versus a child having an asthma flare or asthma attack? Um, I think the adults are able to kind of tell us more. The kids, the kids are kind of a little scarier, both to their parents and I think, if I'm being honest, to their caregivers because, because you know, most of them are real good little campers uh, and, and they're doing fine until they're not doing fine. And, and then all of a sudden, um, again, that slope can be pretty, pretty steep. And so um, kids, you know, sometimes there's uh, something out there that's, uh, that pe people say, yeah, my child had asthma and then she grew out of it when she was six or seven or eight. And that's, that's not really a thing, it's kind of a thing because what happens is, you know, fun fact is we increase our alveolar capacity and we max out, we achieve our adult level at about, at about seven or eight. And so what happens is they just got a little bit more lung capacity so maybe they kind of got a little headroom, they got over the top of that asthma that was so symptomatic and now and now they're doing better uh, because of that, because they've kind of grown up out of that. One of the things, uh, this kind of reminds me of one of the things that I noticed about parents that they struggle with children with asthma is, you know, an adult can kind of have their puffer and they, and they can coordinate that motion pretty well. They can, they can push the plunger, they can inhale the mist, but with a small child, they always wonder like, how are you gonna do that? How do you kind of administer that to a child? And so one of the things that uh, I always like to encourage parents to have is, first of all, um, a, a spacer, uh, a clear spacer that you can kind of activate the, uh, the nebulizer into. And then sometimes you can even have a little face mask on the end that just kind of goes, okay. that just kind of pr presses right up against there. A lot of times parents will kind of panic because they think they have to kind of coordinate that perfectly, you know, and, and, and the truth of the matter is they don't. Once you activate that chamber and you fill that chamber with mist, 
the tiniest particles, the ones that actually get down into the lower airways, those are the ones that you can't even see. Because I think people panic because they kind of see this, they see the activation, they see a little splat of liquid on the walls, and they're like, oh, we, we missed all that medicine. Well, that stuff that you can see was only going to splatter on the inside of your mouth anyway. It wasn't going down. And do so, you naturally just inhale too, or no? Yeah, just, just a nice slow inhalation. Yeah. You don't have to panic. So, so some people want to... I think they they think it's got to be it's got to be a perfectly coordinated you know response and it really doesn't have to be just activate have the child take a, a deep but normal breath and it gets in and so that that chamber can buy you a lot of peace of mind um, and it works really well especially for kids so but for adults too I mean there's probably a fair number of adults that probably would benefit from a chamber as well what other types of advice or treatment would you recommend for asthma sufferers, especially this springtime, if there's a lot of triggers with the allergies? Uh, in terms of treatment, um, some people, uh, you know, it would be something that they could kind of discuss with their doctor. For some people, um, when they think there's going to be a lot of triggers around, they can do an inhaled steroid. Um, uh, uh, as well as an, al uh, as an albuterol, as a, a, what we call a beta agonist or an albuterol. So both of them. Yeah, so both. Um, it turns out that the, the dose of steroid that you get, uh, that goes, the good news is it goes directly to your, to your lungs, so it's, it's effective. The bad news is that the dose is pretty small and it needs a day or two to work, so you can't use it for rescue. Um, and so, uh, but in terms of keeping it at bay, if you get a little ahead of the game, certainly an inhaled steroid for a lot of people s seems to help. And then again, kind of, uh, as we talked about at the top, um, just kind of identifying your triggers and particularly seasonal allergies, smoke, pet hair, that kind of thing, mm -hmm. kind of keeping that Try under control. Try to avoid some of that stuff if yeah, so you can at all possible. Prevention's worth a pound of cure. I love that. Good advice. Final advice for our viewers, maybe if they want to know about urgency rooms and where you're located. Um, urgency room, we've got three locations. We've got Woodbury, Egan, and Vadness Heights. Uh, like everything, it's on, it's on the web, www.urgencyroom.com. Um, one last thing I'd kind of like to say is I think there's a, a, a lot of, um, there's a feeling out there, my patients, when they come to see me and they're really sheepish, they're like, Dr. Johnson, I know you hate it. I was on the internet. And I'm like, no, I love it when you're on the internet. There's great information there. Just make sure that you're on good sites, you know, nothing good, cranky yeah. with, with trolls that say, you know, I, I had asthma and, and I took uh, vitamin C and it got better, or whatever. I mean, it's like there's all that kind of thing. But there's a lot of great information on the internet. And I think people should avail themselves of it and, and uh, just use good common sense about where you're at. Sounds great. Great advice as, uh, as always. Thank you, Dr. Tim Johnson. Thanks. Appreciate it. Now we take a look at a first of its kind new safety program here in Minnesota called Lights On. Basically, local drivers can get repair vouchers instead of tickets for broken car lights. Tell us all about it. We're pleased to have with us Don Samuels, the CEO of Micro Grants. Thank you for being with us. Great to be here. And also we have Commander with the Maplewood uh, Police Department, Mike Short. Reed, so thank Correct. you for being with us. Thank you for having us. So, Don, why don't we start with you? Basically, what is Lights On? What's it all about? Why, why start it? And and how are you involved with it? Yeah, well, we have. I, I'm a CEO of Microgrants, and uh, we came up with this idea of giving vouchers to folks who had their lights broken and uh, get them repaired within the company of uh, organizations that we deal with. And then we decided that uh, maybe we should sp expand it to the entire metro. And so today we have vouchers in every police car in 20 metro cities. That is awesome. And so when a driver is stopped for a broken light, uh, the officer will offer them a voucher uh, to get their lights replaced for free at uh, the nearest Bobby and Steve's Auto World. So why start it? What made you decide? What was the thing that you said, oh, this is something that we should be doing? Well, you know, I'm a former city council member in Minneapolis and uh, chair of the Public Safety Committee. So I have a very kind of uh, connectedness to the police department and to the community. And I understand both sides of the challenges that have been highlighted in recent years in incidents on social media, et cetera. And so uh, this seemed to be a perfect solution because it, it was not a protest or a, 
um, uh, going against anything or anyone. It's helping everyone to have a better police community relationship and to create, uh, turn a confrontation into communication and collaboration. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. Absolutely. Really good idea. So, Commander, why did the Maplewood Police Department decide to be one of the more than a <coughs> two dozen other police departments to get involved? For the exact reason Don identifies. I mean, you know, when you look at some of the pillars of the 21st Century Policing Report um, that come out of the President's Task Force, one of the first pillars involves, you know, trust within the community. Um, this gives us in law enforcement an outlet to help build that trust. I mean, you know, when an average citizen is pulled over for a traffic violation, they may not even know why they're being stopped. In this case, I mean, a lot of people don't even really know that they have an equipment violation, a headlight out, a tail light out, or something that effect. This, in effect, kind of is a positive win-win for not only the citizen, but mm -hmm. for law enforcement as well. If our officers can issue them a voucher to have that equipment repaired without cost to them, it's, like I said, it's a win-win. And you think that's a great idea then, obviously? Because it Absolutely. goes with that whole mission and, right. and that. So basically, how does it work? Effectively, like I pointed out, I mean, what'll happen is officers who are out on patrol, and most of these are going to occur during the nighttime hours because that's where the equipment violations mm -hmm. are more, more visible. Um, but when the officer pulls the person over for that equipment violation, you know, they'll usually identify the person and determine if they even knew they had this equipment violation. Um, the officer will issue what looks like a voucher like this, and they're okay. personalized to each individual agency. I mean, as you can see, we have our, you know, patch on there as well, um, but explains the system to them. I mean, most people, I think, when they receive one of these vouchers, I they're are, probably are, totally confused are, are at sli first. Slightly shocked. It's yeah. kind of like, so I'm not getting a citation. I'm getting a voucher to allow me to fix this <laughs> without expense to me. So, yeah. and like I said, I mean, the officer writes the license plate number down on the voucher, and then they go to their nearest uh, Bobby and Steve's location to have it repaired. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean they won't get a ticket if there's some other offense or something, that right? Is Speeding correct. Or that is correct. I mean, like I said, when it comes to either equipment violations or traffic violations, I mean, it's really up to that officer to determine to what extent these violations are occurring at the time of the stop. Um, in most cases, though, if there's an equipment violation, it's a lot better from a public safety standpoint to give them the opportunity to have that repair fixed versus penalizing them with a uh, equipment violation. Right, and isn't it true that, I mean, a lot, not all the time, but necessarily some people may have a light out because they just can't afford to get it repaired? Yes, in fact. Um, and they need the car to get to work and stuff correct. like that? Yeah, in fact, uh, one of our early recipients talked about having three kids, single mom, and she had a broken light and she couldn't afford to fix it. It was a choice between groceries and very basic needs and fixing the light. So what uh, people still have to get to work, right, or to, to, to run errands, so you kind of roll the dice. Yeah. I might get stopped, but then I might not. And so if a month goes by and you don't get stopped, you just allowed yourself to spend a month's worth of money on the necessities and you save that expense, right? So she got stopped three times. Wow. And so now she was at the point where so many warnings, you know, you're gonna get a ticket or you're gonna get your car towed. And um, I, I have someone in my neighborhood who uh, got their car towed because oh, um, they had other <laughs> uh, liabilities involved. And then uh, the, the, the the car was so uh, low cost and low valued, and the price of getting it out of the impound lot after trying to raise the money for a couple of days uh, went so high that she just, single mom with three kids, she just left the car in the impound lot. Wow, and that cycle just keeps, continues yes. to happen. And now she has a violation on her record or a ticket owed, and 
and lost her car. So a lot of people find themselves in that situation where they're, it's a savings for them, a temporary savings to not fix uh, some kind of a maintenance issue. And uh, in some cases, it just leads to deterioration of the vehicle. In some cases, it leads to actually violating the law. So this is one situation where, in fact, you know, we, uh, microgrants also gives grants to people to buy cars to oh, get to work. That's that. part of the thing we do, a transportation grants. If someone's trained up, they're ready to go to work in uh, Maplewood, and they're in Minneapolis, they've got to get a car. Uh, and and we, the, the, the guys at Bobby and Steve's who uh, sells these cars to our grantees say, that people who come in with a broken light for a, with a voucher are 10 times happier than the people who come in to actually get a car. Really? <laughs> yes. Wow. <laughs> because it's, 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 there's so many social dynamics involved. There was an in interaction with the police, which is usually punitive. They didn't expect it. They didn't earn it. It was total, totally free. It's never happened to anybody before. And so there's this sense of um, like something changed in, in their expectation and their understanding of their community. That is awesome. Uh, how long is the program going to last? Is it indefinite as, as yeah, long as the it, money's last? Yes, we, we have about $25,000 in the kitty for this program. We expect it to last maybe six months. And uh, or three months, three to six months. And then, uh, but we're now getting a fundraising effort online to sustain it. But I must say that $25,000, it was unsolicited. It That's was awesome. given by three different people who heard about the program and said, hey, I want to give money to that. Right. So it's very appealing, we're not worried about it. And it, it was launched just, I think, last year or last week or so, or recently. About two weeks ago. Yes. So, how, any idea how many have been impacted so far, drivers? By yes, this? I think it's close to ninety. Wow. Yeah, mm -hmm. and um, and by the way, we have a lights on Facebook page, and, we, and then microgrants has a microgrants.net has a lights on donate button on its face uh, page. And so people can go and we, we're doing crowdfunding for well, that. Well, good luck with that. Thank that you. sounds like an awesome program. Absolutely. So thank you. I guess we're out of time. No problem. But Mike, final comments, Commander? Um, like I said, you know, when law enforcement throughout our area is allowed the opportunity to do something positive for members of the community, and especially in this manner, it's a win-win for us and the, and the citizens. So we appreciate the fact that it was offered up to us. John Samuels, thank you for being with us. Thank you. Great and to Commander, be here. Thank you. Thank you. And we'd like to thank you for joining us. We hope you join us next time on Inside Healthcare. We'll see you then, everyone.